So yeah, we are finishing up the story uh, this week. Uh, we've been journeying for over 31 weeks through this abridged um, chronological version of the Bible. I hope you've enjoyed it. hope you've enjoyed this study. As Annie talked about earlier, it really focuses on the, the story of God's redemption. And it's been really good for me in, in my own growth as a believer to... To look at God's story from a 30,000 foot view, right? We, we often go through the books of the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Um, but it's very helpful for us as believers at times to, to take a step back and look at the whole story of God's redemption. So this morning, we come to the book of Revelation. Uh, we come to, in my mind, the greatest chapter in the book. It's the last chapter uh, where we, we see the victory of Christ. This morning, we're going to look at Revelation 21. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Revelation 21. There's an outline in the bulletin if you'd like to follow along. So last September, we started with the very beginning. We talked about that in the upper story, God created the lower story. God created a paradise where he could come and have a relationship with his creation. That was the purpose of why man was created, to be in a relationship with God. Well, we talked about the fact that Adam and Eve messed things up, didn't they? The, the first humans chose to sin. And in choosing to sin, they were expelled from paradise. After they were expelled from paradise, things went from bad to worse. Things got so bad that God punished the earth by sending the flood. But then after the flood, God made a promise and put in place a plan to save his creation, right? Because God loves his creation. We talked about from there that, that God created a nation called Israel through Abraham and his family, and that every detail of that nation pointed to the coming of Jesus, to the coming of the Messiah. Well, after 2,000 years, the Messiah came. And John tells us, John chapter 1, that he came to his own but his own did not receive him. But to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. But not only that, to be a part of his church, his family. When Jesus went back to heaven to be with the Father, he gave us his Holy Spirit. And he gave his church a commission. What was that commission? Go tell others. Go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We looked at the Apostle Paul and his ministry. Paul was, was one of the great disciple makers of the church, starting churches all over the Roman Empire. And he eventually gave his life for the Lord. Well, that leads us all the way up to the last chapter. The last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, we see that the apostle John is on the island of Patmos. He's exiled to this island because of his faith. He was most likely one of the last apostles alive. Maybe he was the last apostle alive at that point. And in his sovereignty, God gave John this amazing vision of what was to come. See, the church had spread throughout most of the Roman Empire by that point. There were converts everywhere. Churches rising up everywhere. But the church of Jesus Christ was being persecuted. 
opposition had, had come against it. And so God gave John this vision of what was to come so that he could encourage the believers. Starting in Asia with the seven churches. And then the rest of the Roman Empire. So that brings us to the book of Revelation. And I'm going to give us a little bit of a Reader's Digest summary of the book of Revelation. And then this morning, we're going to camp in chapter 21. That's where we're going to be mostly today. Well, what we see in the book of Revelation is the words of Jesus and Paul coming true, right? What Jesus and Paul prophesied is that in the end times, things would go from bad to worse. The heart of man would grow hard. And more and more, our world will rebel against God. That's what we see in Revelation. And in Revelation, we see an antichrist coming into power along with a false prophet. And we see the nations of the world coming together and submitting to the authority of this antichrist. And this antichrist will lead the world in rebellion against Jesus. That's what the scriptures teach. But just when it, th- just when it looks like nothing c- could get worse, Jesus Christ will return. And we see that in chapter 20 Revelation. We see Jesus coming on, on a white horse. And Jesus goes to battle against the Antichrist and the false prophet and defeats them through the word of God. And the Antichrist and the false beast are thrown into the lake of fire. After that, Satan, the devil, who's behind the Antichrist, will be bound for a thousand years. Excuse me, but then Satan will be released one final time to oppose the people of God. But then in that final battle, the armies of God will defeat Satan and the forces of evil that one last time. We see that at the end of chapter 20, where Satan and all evil are cast into the lake of fire forever, for eternity. After that, at the end of of chapter 20, we see the great white throne judgment. And the peoples of the world will come to the throne and they will be judged by God. They'll be judged by how they live their lives. Chapter 20 says, All whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will spend eternity with God. But all whose names are not written written in the Lamb's book of life will be banished to the lake of fire. That's where we come in in chapter 21. We come to this incredible vision now after the judgment of the new Jerusalem. So if you found chapter 21, go ahead and stand. We're going to read a few verses there. I know it was the Reader's Digest version. As I was studying that, I was thinking, man, we got to go through the book of Revelation. We just got to. So I know sometime in the future, we're going to go through the book of Revelation. But we come to the New Jerusalem, chapter 21, with this vision that that God gives to John through this angel of what's going to come after the judgment. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them 
and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Would you pray with me? God, I just pray that as we look at this important section of Scripture, Lord, that you would give us insight into this vision that you have given John. Lord, we know that there is so much of this vision, it's hard to understand. A lot of it, Lord, seems like symbolism, and we don't know exactly what it means, Lord. But I, I, I pray today, God, as we study this, that, that we would pull out of this the precepts that you want us to know, you want us to learn. So, Lord, that we can live a life where we will be unashamed when we meet you in the air. So, Lord, that we can live a life where we tell others about you. Let me pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this vision of the new Jerusalem, of the new heaven and earth, was an encouragement to the church in the first century because they were facing extreme persecution for their faith. And it reminds us of the truth that this life is not the end. Amen? Amen. This is not the end. The title of our sermon, The End, The Beginning of Life. I shared that a couple weeks ago. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's final words. This is not the end. And it's an encouragement to us, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, that this life is only temporary. Friends, that you and I were meant to spend eternity with Jesus and with those that we love and care about. That's what this vision is about. So we're going to take a look at this vision of the new Jerusalem today. We're going to camp on these last two chapters. And there's three important precepts I want us to pull out of this. Here's the first one. We should know the new Jerusalem is a place God is working on. God is working on in the present. Right? Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you. I love the old Keith Green song. It says that God created the earth in seven days, but he's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. Man, I tell you what. <clears throat> heaven's going to be amazing. Amen? Amen? I mean, it's going to be an amazing place. I can't wait. <laughs> Jesus is working on heaven now. Chapter 21, verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, when John says a new heaven and a new earth, he uses the Greek word kine for new. And, and kine, what kine means is refreshing, clean. It's not new in, in terms of like new in order, like I had an old car and now I got a new car. 
It's more like the fact that I took my old beat-up car out and I got it detailed. Now, I don't know why I would do that. That car, I, don't, I think it's hopeless. But that's what it means. It means new in terms of being refreshed. And what John saw in his vision is a new heaven and a new earth, right? The old heaven and the old earth under the Antichrist had the nations rebelling against God. The, the nations full of idolatry, persecuting believers. But now in this new vision of heaven and earth, we see a new earth full of people loving God and loving one another, living in harmony with each other, in submission to King Jesus. That's the vision. That, that's what John saw. He goes on to say in verse 1, there was no longer any sea. Now what did John mean by that? D different scholars ha have different views of what those few words mean. One scholar I read this week, the commentary, said that the sea represented evil. Because we see earlier in Revelation that it was out of the sea that came the Antichrist, the beast. And so what John is saying in this vision is that there is no longer any sea. There is no longer any evil in the new heaven and new earth. That's one view. John MacArthur's commentary says literally that the sea represents water. He says there's going to be no longer any water in heaven. That's what his commentary says. But you know, I like a, a view that I heard several years ago. I heard a pastor teach on. And this idea of no longer any sea, he, he viewed it more figuratively. Remember, John was exiled on the island of Patmos, right? He was alone. John was separated from all those that he held dear. He was separated from his brothers and sisters in Christ. He was separated from his family. And so when John says, no more see, what he's saying is, no more separation from those that I love and care about. Finally, finally, I will be reunited with all my brothers and sisters in Christ. And my family members that I love. I like that view of what John is saying there. Okay, cool. Uh, he next says in verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now in the Bible, the word heaven describes three different phenomena. Okay? Sometimes in the Bible when we hear heaven, it's talking about the atmosphere around the earth, right? The heaven. Sometimes it's talking about the planets and the stars, the solar system, the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God, right? Psalm says. But sometimes heaven is talking about the place where God currently dwells. And Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 12. He talks about somebody he knew who had a vision of the third heaven. The third heaven. And that's the place where God currently dwells. I believe that's what John's talking about here in his vision. He had a vision of the third heaven. And he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of this place where God dwells. As I said earlier, in John 14, 2, when Jesus was going back to heaven, he said, in my Father's house are many rooms. Right? And Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to prepare a place for you. In the present, Jesus is working on heaven. And that's the vision that, that John saw. He saw this vision of the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, the place where God dwells. 
to this new heaven and this new earth. He says it's prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I love that image. Bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I'll, I'll never forget that day when I stood at the altar. And I remember when Vanessa walked in that back door of the church. Wow. There was nothing more beautiful. Nothing more special to me than to see Vanessa walk down that aisle. And that's the vision we get of this new Jerusalem, right? Like a bride on her wedding day. This new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. Something very special that God has prepared for his people. But you know, the most important feature of this new Jerusalem is verse 3. Look at verse 3. John says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will will be with them and be their God. Wow, what a vision. That's incredible. I talked about earlier about the fact that because of Adam and Eve's sin, they were expelled from paradise, right? God God put a protection around paradise. Adam and Eve were expelled because of their rebellion. But now we have this new vision that, that paradise has been regained. The dwelling of God is with men. As I talked about two weeks ago, when I I talked about Paul's final words, Paul was looking forward to that day when he would meet Jesus face to face. Remember that? Second Timothy? And that Jesus would place that crown of righteousness on his head. Well, that's the vision that John has here in chapter 21. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, he says, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now in this current state, we try as hard as we can to relate to God, right? We try to, we try to, to listen to his word. We try to, to talk to him through prayer, We're involved in Bible study. But you know, sometimes it it feels like we're looking at God through a mirror or or through a, a foggy windshield. It's hard sometimes to discern what God is saying. Friends, it's not always going to be that way. There will be a day when we will see Jesus face to face. And he's going to put that crown of righteousness on your head. And say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Man, I can't wait until that day. Can you? Can't wait. Face to face. And what will it be like? Look at verse 4. John says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. In this new Jerusalem, there's going to be no more tears, friends. There's going to be no more crying. There's going to be no more mourning. The old order of things, because of sin, is full of suffering. It's full of trials. Some of us have have buried loved ones this last year. No more. No more death. The old order of things has passed away. And when we get to that new Jerusalem, there's going to be no more tears. Verse 5. 
verse 5 says, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Everything new. No more natural disasters. No more Hurricane Katrina's. No more wildfires. No more famines. No more wars. And we will have new bodies. No more bald spots. No more wrinkles. No more arthritis. Thank God, right? New bodies. We're going to be like Jesus. We're going to have these new glorified bodies, friends. Man, the older I get, I can't wait. <laughs> Talking to some, some friends today in the hallway about that. I can't wait till we get those new bodies. No more suffering. No more pain. No more trials. God wanted John to encourage his fellow believers with this vision that he had seen because they were going through a tough time. And Riviera, this should also be a huge encouragement to us with no matter what you're facing today. As Paul says, it's a momentary trial. But it's, in, it's achieving for us a glory beyond comparison. A light and momentary trial. The second thing that we see in this new Jerusalem is this new Jerusalem is a place for the faithful. That this place is a place that Jesus is creating for those who see their need for him and have submitted their lives to him as Savior and Lord. It's for the faithful. Look at verse 5. God says, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He says, John, don't miss this. Write this down. This is important. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Life, existence, hope, peace, love, joy. It starts with God and it ends with God. He's the bookends. Paul said in, in Acts 17, he said, In him we live and move and have our being. It's all about God, friends. It's all about him. He is the Alpha and the Omega. If you want eternal life, it's found in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is nothing else in this world that can fill that God-shaped vacuum in your heart. The only thing that can fill it is Jesus. Having that relationship with Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. In the beginning of the story, we saw that it began with God and he's still the key player in the last chapter. It's still all about him. God says in verse 6, he says, To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Without cost. It's free. The spring of life is none other than God himself. Look at what Jesus said in John 7, 37 through 38. Jesus said, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and called out in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in me, just as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. He was speaking about the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. If anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. Jesus has made the spring of life available. And all we have to do is choose to come to him. All we have to do is humble ourselves, see our need for him, and choose to go. And John gives us this vision of heaven of the spring of the water of life. Those who see their need for God, like the woman at the well in John 4, remember that story? Will be filled with the water of life. John goes on to say in verse 7, he says, He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Who are those that that overcome? It's the thirsty. It's those who see their need for Jesus and believe and trust him for salvation. And then the Holy Spirit comes in their life and the Holy Spirit begins to change them from the inside out. And they start bearing fruit the fruit of the Spirit. They start becoming godly men and godly women. That's the vision here. Those are those that overcome. To these children, God will say, I am your God and you are my child. I love that vision. God looking you in the eye and saying, Nancy, I am your God, and you are my child. Matt, I am your God, and you are my child. And what a vision that God will say that to us. But, verse 8, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice sorcery, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Wow. The first death is hard enough. Seeing these bodies waste away and having to experience death. But for those who are cowardly, and what John is talking about is he's talking about those that submitted to the authority of the Antichrist. Those that that would not stand up for Christ. They would not to submit to Jesus as Lord of their lives, but instead they submitted to the Antichrist, to the cowardly, to the unbelieving, to the wicked. They will experience what Revelation calls the second death. They will be banished to the lake of burning sulfur as the Antichrist, as the beast, as Satan, as the demons. Wow. Man, I don't want anybody I know to spend eternity in that place. Nobody I know. And I imagine you don't want anybody you know to spend eternity there. 
And I hope that if you're here today, I, I hope that, that you're one of those people that have heeded the call of Jesus to come to him, to believe in him, to have the streams of living water inside of you. And I hope that through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's given you the strength to overcome, to overcome those habitual sins or temptations so that he will say to you, I am your God and you are my child. Lastly, I want to give you just a quick little tour through the new Jerusalem. We get this this vision at the end of chapter 21, beginning of chapter 22 of, of the new Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem is one spectacular place. I want us just to see this place. Because if we get a glimpse of what this new Jerusalem is like, I believe it's going to help us with whatever trial or struggle or obstacle we're dealing with now. Even if we're persecuted for our faith. This vision of heaven could could give us the strength that we need to overcome. John says in verse 9, One of the angels who had seen the seven bowls full of God's wrath came to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Verse 10 says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The new Jerusalem and the bride are described as one in this vision. Why is that? Because cities are characterized by their inhabitants, right? So that in the Bible, when Sodom and Gomorrah was called a wicked city, it was because the inhabitants of the city were given to wickedness. And there were times when Jerusalem was called a righteous city. Well, this vision of the new Jerusalem, the angel calls it the holy city because the inhabitants of the city are holy. They're godly. They're righteous. He says in verse 11, it shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. The city shined with the glory of God. Its brilliance was like a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. How many of you have a jasper? Anybody have any jasper? Yeah? Well, jasper is actually not clear. It's a precious stone, but it's actually opaque. You can't see through it. So this vision that John got of the new Jerusalem was something special, something different. The city shone, it shined like a red jasper. But it was clear, he says. You could see through the walls. I was thinking, well, why, why would it be clear? Because if it was opaque, it would not reflect the glory of God. And because of the fact that it's clear, the glory of God, the glory of Jesus shines through the whole city. John says in verse 12, he says, the city had a great wall and 12 gates. Three on every side. So there's three gates on every side of the city. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, why do we see the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on top of the gates? Because God's covenant with Israel is eternal. It's eternal. Next we see verse 14. He says, the walls of the city had 12 foundations. 
And there were the names of the 12 apostles. Okay? So we got the three gates, 12 gates, three on every side. On the top are, are the names of the tribes of Israel. And then we have the foundation. The walls of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles. So what John is seeing in this vision is he is seeing Romans 11, verse 25 and 26, becoming a reality. What do we see in Romans 11, 25 to 26? We see all of God's people, God's two covenant people, Jews and Gentiles, all together before the throne of God. And that's the vision that, that John sees here. He goes on to say the city was measured at 12,000 stadia on all sides. 12,000 stadia is approximately 1,400 miles. And so the new Jerusalem is described as this cosmic cube. It's 1,400 miles long, it's 1,400 miles wide, and it's 1,400 miles high. Now, how that works, I don't know. I don't know. But that's what he says. He says the walls are 144 cubits thick. That's about 200 feet wide. And the walls are made with incredible red, clear jasper. The foundation of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone, sapphire, topaz, emerald, diamonds, every precious stone decorated the walls. And catch this, the gates of the city are pearls. Now, not these little pearls that people have the gates of the city are pearls the gates are made of pearls one giant pearl are are the 12 gates of the city it's like something we've never seen before Uh, nobody's ever seen a pearl that big but that's what the gates of the new jerusalem are going to be made of pearls And the streets of the city were pure gold, John says. They were transparent like glass. Boy, that's some place. Some place. And again, I, I, I don't think that the new Jerusalem is decorated there because God cares that much about jewels or gold. I believe it's decorated that way because it reflects the glory of God. His incredible glory. Then in verse 22, John says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In the Old Testament, we had the temple and we had the priests and we had the altars, and we had the sacrifices. The purpose of that was to mediate a holy God with a sinful people. But not anymore. In the New Jerusalem, there is no Old Testament temple. The temple is God and Jesus. Excuse me, there's no need for a temple because Jesus Christ is the mediator He dealt with sin once for all. And there's also no need for the sun or the moon to shine on the city because John says the brilliance of God lights up the city. Look at verse 24. He says the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Up to this point in Revelation, the nations represented those who were allied against God. But now the, the nations represent the vision of Revelation 7, where the great multitude of every tribe, 
people and language stand before the throne of the king. That's the vision John saw. No more wars, no more fighting, no more racism. Every nation, every tongue, every tribe together, unified before the throne of Jesus. Wow, what a vision. The kings of the earth, which we'll all be, right? Because we're all going to have our crowns of righteousness on our heads. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into the new Jerusalem. And our splendor will be our holy lives, our godliness. The fact that we reflect the image of Christ, that's our splendor. But verse 27 says, none that are impure will ever enter the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is for God's people. For those that have come to the spring of life, who've received Jesus into their lives and are living for him. Lastly, in chapter 22, we see the vision of paradise regained. We see God's plan of redemption full circle and we see the Garden of Eden again. Look at, ver- verse, or look at chapter 22, verses 1 through 4. John says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its, its fruit every month, And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. We see the river of life flowing from the throne of God. Remember that back in Genesis chapter 1, there was a river in the garden, right? In paradise that gave life. But now we see paradise regained and we now see the river of God, the river of life. And the river of life flows from the throne of God and gives life to all of God's people. We see the tree of life also in this vision bearing fruit. After Adam and Eve sinned, they were banished from the garden. Why? So they would not partake of the tree of life and live forever. So it's the tree of life that gives everlasting life. In this vision, we see the tree of life, actually multiple trees, down the banks of this river bearing fruit, bearing crops for the people of God to partake. And John says, the leaves of the trees give healing to the nations. Wow. All the enmity, all the strife, all the fighting between nations is brought healing through the tree of life. Unity, peace. True community comes through the tree of life. And in verse 3, John says, no longer will there be any curse. The curse of the fall was death. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Christ took on our penalty, our curse, took on death on the cross. 
And now we, we see this vision of the Jerusalem where there's no more curse. There's no more death. Death is a thing of the past. We will live forever with God. John says, The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, at the very last chapter of the Bible, We see the lower story and the upper story as one same story. We we see paradise regained. We now see God and his people together in the new Jerusalem. We see the people of God serving God and Jesus and their names, the, the name of God is written on their foreheads, which means what? It means they belong to God. They are His, and He is theirs. That's the future, friends. That was the vision that, that God gave to John to share with the churches of Asia, and it's a vision that God has given us. As Revelation says, we we can expect things to get harder. We can expect persecution. But always remember that that is not the end of the story. The end of the story is Jesus comes back and is victorious. And we spend eternity with him. That's the end. That's the story. The question that I have for all of us to consider this morning as we we think about this new Jerusalem is, are you ready? Are are you ready for Jesus to return? Look at one of the final statements Jesus makes, Revelation 22, 12. He says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Jesus Christ is coming back. It may be soon. It may be today. We don't know. But we will be rewarded for how we have lived our lives. The Apostle John, he was aware of that. In 1 John chapter 2, the one thing that he was concerned about is that he would be ashamed when he met Jesus face to face. He told the church, he said, live in such a way that you will not be ashamed when you see the Lord face to face. He says, those that have that hope purify themselves. They they, they live a life of godliness and holiness as they await the return of Jesus. The other thing that, that... that says to me is is the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back and as we, we saw in this passage what that means is that some people will spend eternity with him and some people won't and so there's an urgency there right there's an urgency that, that we think about those people that we love and care about who don't know the Lord Maybe people who haven't even heard the gospel message. And because of the fact that Jesus is coming back, and it could be soon, we begin praying for those people. And we share the gospel with them. Because the last thing that we want is what it says right there in God's word. That on that day of judgment, they will find that their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And they will spend eternity separated from the Lord. I don't want anybody that I love and care about to be in that place. 
Not because of the fact that I could have done something about it, right? There's, there's a lot that we don't control. We can't save anybody. But we sure can tell them about Jesus. Amen?